well, everyone, thanks for coming and spending some time today. Um, I, I guess you're all here because you're curious about uh, color correction, and this is meant to be an intro to color correction. So if you haven't done a lot or you're fairly new to it or you have some questions or you're confused about any of it, uh, we'll try to give you a foundation uh, to be able to build from and develop your own workflow and, and best practices from this. So uh, we'll get started. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we'll get into the presentation here. OK, I imagine everybody can, can see the desktop. So let's get into this here, if it'll let me. OK, so. Uh, this is meant to be, uh, like, like I said, an introductory course. So um, we'll uh, get started and go over some of the objectives for the class that we want to cover today. So first thing, um, if you're someone who has a camera and loves that little auto button uh, for both exposure and, and white balance and things like that, um, this will give you an option and the know-how to switch over to the manual exposure and white balance mode. Um, that works a lot better for if you're, if you're planning on doing any post-color correction uh, to shoot in manual. It gives you a baseline. Uh, auto can be all over the place and uh, it can make it more complicated when you try to do post-color correction. Okay, um, understanding the color of light. So, Light isn't always just white. Um, we perceive it as white because our eyes and brain constantly adjust to the conditions of the color and the light. So um, our, our brains do that and the camera has sensors, but it doesn't have a brain and it can't always make the best judgment calls when it comes to uh, exposing and um, calculating white balance. So we're, we'll look into the, the Kelvin scale and how to make the best use, to, use of it. Uh, the importance of white balancing, why white balance? Uh, how to white balance your camera? Just some general info depending on what kind of camera you have. Um, camcorders and DSLRs and smartphones all can be white balanced. They all might have different ways of doing it, uh, but they can pretty much all re achieve the same results. Uh, how to read scopes. So um, this is the one thing that I think confuses most people are these scopes, the waveform monitor, vector scope, the histogram, the RGB parade. All of them provide really detailed information that's really great for color correction. Um, not everybody has a great monitor or ha if they do have a great monitor, it's not always cut, um, uh, calibrated. And so your eye and the monitor may be seeing different colors than what is actually in the video signal. And so that's where the scopes come in. The scopes are really great for being in a no nonsense as it is um, detail of what is present in the video signal. And we'll learn how to decipher those and make full use of those in our uh, post application. Um, basic post color correction. White balance, uh, black ba balance, adjusting the exposure, color balance, and saturation. And how to achieve a proper flesh tone. Um, I'm going to demonstrate different things in the different packages, so I may not cover exactly the same material in each package. Um, but you'll get a basic understanding on how the workflow works that you can pretty much apply if you're working in Premiere or Final Cut, Resolve. Uh, they all work basically the same. Okay, now what's really popular now, of course, is using the term color grading. And quite often it's used in line or in, in place of color correction. And they're actually two different things. Um, color correction is the process, process of adjusting the exposure and contrast and color to where you get a consistent um, image that's within the legal limits. Uh, video has legal limits in both color and, and, um, and brightness. 
and makes it so you can have a base foundation that has consistent color and exposure from one shot to the next um, that allows you to make an effective color grade on top of that. And the color grading is the process of where you at creatively alter the color corrected image to where you're, you're imparting a tone or a mood to the, the scene. So for instance, if you are doing a, uh, a mystery show, you might have darker tones throughout uh, more blues and, and cooler colors um, than you would. And instead of loading your footage and then immediately putting a grade on it, you'd wanna go through the color correction phase first, balance and, and make your footage neutral in color and exposure, and then apply the color grade after that. Okay, auto versus manual. That lovely little switch <laughs> that's present on, on a lot of camcorders and, ca and other cameras, they always outline the, the auto, like that's the preferred one. Um, I'm not sure why they do that, but uh, I mo noticed most manufacturers always put, put that in, a, in an outline, like that's, that's the one to pick. So uh, we'll, we'll go through and look at the differences between shooting in auto and shooting in manual and what the benefits and, and uh, setbacks are for the two. So shooting in manual exposure and white balance, it provides a consistent baseline, like I mentioned before, for color correcting your footage. Um, shooting in auto exposure and white balance uh, causes values that are constantly changing. So like if you're uh, at, a, at, a, at a park and you have your camera in auto and you're doing a panning shot across the group, every time the light changes, um, if, if people are wearing darker shirts and then you pan over and someone's wearing a brighter shirt or there's a bright background, that, that, that exposure is going to be fluctuating up and down. And the same thing with the um, white balance, um, out, like outdoor white balance, it, the normal white balance is about 5,600K in the Kelvin scale. But depending on whether the, you're in direct sunlight or in the, in the shadows or whatnot, that value can change several hundred or sometimes even a few thousand degrees Kelvin, uh, depending on what's in the scene or how the scene changes throughout. You mix those two together and you have a real uh, difficult situation when it comes to trying to do any kind of post-color correction. So here's kind of a quick chart showing the difference uh, what we were just talking about with the auto white balance and auto exposure in a typical scene if things are people are moving in and out of the scene or things are changing you may not notice it specifically but the camera is constantly making adjustments constantly making adjustment uh, excuse me adjustments to the exposure constantly making adjustments to the white balance to try to neutralize and even everything out and so by going into manual mode and locking in your exposure and locking in your white balance, like the two lines down below, you provide a consistent baseline for making corrections and adjustments in post that will, that once you set them will maintain a consistency throughout. Uh, you can color correct it, the auto white balance and auto exposure to a certain degree. You can make kind of a global effect on it but you can't make a specific effect. I guess you can, but it's really, really difficult to do that. And after a while of doing that, if you're, if you're used to shooting in audio, auto, um, you'll learn right away that it's much better to shoot in manual mode. Okay, so first part of this, we'll get into the exposure. So I don't know if many of you have seen this or not, but this is referred to as the exposure triangle. In the exposure triangle, relies on three things to, that a camera uses to um, expose an image. Um, the first one is the aperture, and the aperture is the opening on the lens. It's kind of like the iris of your eye. As you go into different situations, your, your iris will open or close depending on the amount of light that it sees. And the same thing with a camera aperture. Uh, it can open and close and allow in more or less light that hits the sensor and that affects the exposure. Second thing is shutter speed. And the shutter speed is the mechanical or electronic device 
that opens and closes very briefly to expose the sensor to the light coming in from the aperture through the lens. Now, the shutter speed can also affect um, things like motion blur. So if you have moving objects, uh, you can affect the sharpness of those moving objects by using a faster shutter or a narrower shutter angle. And in so doing, lower your exposure that you have to compensate for by either opening the aperture or increasing the gain. And that's where the exposure triangle comes in. Uh, the, the third part is the ISO or gain. Now the ISO is the, ter is the current term for determining the sensitivity of the sensor. Its origins started back in the film days uh, when they used, when cinematographers would use the term ASA and ASA and ISO, uh, you may hear, hear one or the other, the current term is ISO, they mean the same thing. The numbers are the same thing. The difference is that ASA was a term used that meant American Standards Association. ISO is the International Standards Organization. So when they rate the sensitivity of a sensor or a film stock and they give it a number, those are interchangeable. So on a lot of cameras, it's stated what the sensitivity of the camera is, what the, sen the native sensitivity of the sensor is. So if you look down here at the bottom, um, a lot of cameras, modern cameras, have sensitivities of uh, 400, 500, or even 800. And some cameras, some of the newer models, actually have dual sensitivities that they can be set to. Um, like for instance, I have a camera that has a lower um, uh, sensitivity of, of ISO 400 and an upper one of 3200. At Metro East, we have a cinema camera that has um, a sensitivity of 800 and 2500. And those are both considered native and uh, allow you to shoot in lower light situations where you need the more, more of the gain with adding very little noise or grain to the signal, which can be a, a real um, a great thing to have in those situations. It gives you a lot more flexibility. So again, um, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO make up the exposure triangle. So uh, the first part of it, the apertures and f-stops, again, the aperture is the physical part of the lens that opens and closes and allows more or less light in. So the smaller the number, the larger the iris opening is and the more light it lets in, whereas the larger the number, the smaller the opening and the less light comes in. The side effect of that is that um, not only does it let more or less light in, but it also changes your depth of field. And your depth of field is when you have a subject in front of the camera, say a person standing in front of the camera and there's a background. At a smaller aperture like f16, you're letting in less light, but you're also adding a lot of depth of field. So if you focus on the person in front of the camera, the background may be in as sharp a focus as the subject is. Whereas where you open the aperture up much wider and you focus on your subject, your subject will be in focus and your background will be softer or even out of focus. And this is a good way of separating your subject from your background. So at the bottom, you'll see that each f-stop is either double or half the amount of light. So, and this, this has to do with shutters and apertures and ISO. Um, there's a lot of doubling and, and halving going on with the exposure settings. So each stop is either double or half. So for instance, if you have your iris set at f4, that would be letting in twice the amount of light as f5.6 and half the amount of light as f2.8. Okay, the shutter speed portion, um, they have both shutter angles and shutter speeds that are in fractions of, sec of a second. 
So the one in the illustration is in degrees. So if you look at it like a pie chart, um, the shutter rotates. And so you have 360 degrees would be a fully open shutter that, that doesn't close and gives you more light, but it also increases the amount of blur in the picture. Uh, the, the normal setting primarily for shutters, if you're using your camera and it's set to degrees, is 180 degrees. And then, and that exposes for exactly half the amount of time uh, as your frame rate. So if you are shooting, say, at 30 frames per second, your shutter would be the equivalent of 1 60th of a second. And at 24 frames per second, it would be the equivalent of 1 48th and so on. As you change your shutter speed or your, or excuse me, if you change your frame rate, your shutter speed, if it's set to degrees, will automatically compensate it so it matches your frame rate. Again, the higher the number, the smaller the opening, and the sharper moving objects will be, like our football player that's, that's, that's here. You go down to a high shutter speed, like a 500th or a thousandth of a second, and it basically freezes him in place when he's moving for each frame. And the slower shutter speeds and the wider openings allow more motion to happen and it creates a blur or a smear in the image. Okay, the third part, ISO, is again, going back to the sensitivity of the camera sensor itself. And most cameras can go anywhere from uh, 200 or 250 on up to 2,500 or beyond. Some significantly more than that. Um, and again, your native uh, value that you have for your camera, like say if your camera is set to 400, a sensitivity of 400 as a native um, baseline, uh, each time you double that number, like going from 400 to 800 would be one stop, and it would make the camera twice as sensitive as light. If you go from 400 to 200 uh, over here, then you'll see that you, that halves the amount of light. Uh, some cameras also express their sensitivity in gain, where zero dB right here is the base exposure level sensitivity for the camera. And you can have steps of going below that to lower the sensitivity up to sometimes one stop or more, which is every six dBs is a stop, to significantly higher amounts. So again, every six dB equals one stop or a doubling of the light to the previous number before that. Side effect is, uh, as you increase your sensitivity, you can increase the grain. And I don't know if this is really clear here, but each uh, this first picture is fairly clean of noise. It's at the native uh, value of a camera. And as you bring up the gain or double the exposure amount um, with your sensitivity, it's an, it amplifies that, that sensor and you can pick up more noise as well as more exposure. So the, the picture on the right here has much more noise in it than the, the middle picture or the picture on the left. Okay, now here's something that uh, is really useful when it comes to, to determining exposure. And this is really handy, not only when you shoot originally, but when you do color and exposure correction and post-production. So uh, there was a photographer named Ansel Adams who is probably known as the greatest landscape photographer of the 20th century. And uh, he was born around the turn of the century of, of the, I think, 1902 and lived into the 1980s. And he developed this zone system for exposure and printing that details what each step in the uh, exposure line is starting at, at zero, which is pure black with no detail. The step one is near black with where you can see some slight tonality in the picture, textured black where you can actually make out textures in an object like, like shadow detail. Um, number three has average dark materials and low values. Uh, number four is dark foliage dark stone or landscape shadows. And number five is middle gray. And middle gray comes into play a lot when it comes to 
exposing your camera. And quite often you will use a gray card to set your exposure. And that middle gray is in zone five. And that sets the exposure, that averages out the exposure. So if you point your lens and, and the gray card fills the screen and you set your exposure, that will pretty much give you an average um, amount of exposure uh, for your shot. Um, zone six is average Caucasian skin. Uh, number seven is very light skin in shadows, in snow. Uh, number eight is textured snow. Uh, number nine is slight texture. And number nine is really the highest point of your exposure where you can actually make out detail uh, in the shot. And zone 10 is, is a pure white or peak white. Um, going there or beyond will clip your, your whites to where there's really little or no detail present in the picture. And it's the opposite of pure, pure black where all your blacks are crushed and there's very little detail present in the shadows or in dark objects. So we'll be revisiting uh, this zone system as we go along. Okay, two tools to assist, uh, excuse me, to assist in setting exposure. First thing we have is a neutral density filter and neutral density filters are usually built into a lot of camcorders and, and cinema cameras. Um, and what they are are like sunglasses for your camera. So if it's really bright outside and your camera, the sensitivity of your camera would, would cause an overexposure, uh, where if you stopped down your, your lens aperture and you lowered your ISO rating and you um, increased your shutter speed, you still really can't get there uh, as your, for your exposure. So that's where neutral density filters come in and they are, each, each step has a different grade. So you can start out with a mild light reduction all the way up to a significant light reduction. Also, there's another type of neutral density filter, which is a screw-on type that, that attaches to the front of your lens. And it rotates and it provides a variable filter that's similar to the built-in filters in the camera. And an external filter can stop light down anywhere from two stops, which is half the amount of light, all the way down to 400, which is a near uh, loss of light and everywhere in between. And it's really an, a great accessory to have. Okay, the, th the second thing we're looking at is a gray card. And what's neat about this device, uh, this particular one is it's gray on one side and white on the other, and it's collapsible and fits into a little pouch. So you can easily put this thing in your camera bag, take it out on location with you, and it's really handy for not only setting your exposure, but also for setting your white balance. You just flip, you set your exposure on one side, you flip it over, set your white balance, and you're often good to go with that. Okay, the fourth thing is a chip chart or a color chart. And that's really handy for in post-production, being able to match up your highlights, mid-tones and, and shadow areas, as well as absolute black. And as well as, uh, if you look on the left, there are variations of things like skin tones available. And on the right is um, a color chart similar to what you'd see on color bars that, that some cameras can generate. Okay, um, another way of helping to expose your camera is called a histogram and cameras most cameras always have some form of display that shows the amount of exposure. Uh, they could be a waveform monitor, sometimes a waveform and a vector scope, or uh, a histogram, or an, a fourth thing called false color. And we'll look at each one of these. What the histogram does is it provides a range of tones or levels and brightness to the image. And so if you look at the left part of the screen, you'll see that uh, there's a scale that starts at zero, and as, as you move to the right, it ends up at 100 over here. And these areas here are the darker tones. This area is the mid-tones, and this area is the highlights. And this looks like a mountain range, and quite often this is what you'll see. And as you increase your exposure, this mountain range will scoot to the right 
And as you decrease your exposure, it'll scoot to the left with optimum expo exposure being kind of in the middle. And we'll come back to this later on to explain more. Okay, the, the other thing you can use that's a great utility is the zebra display. The zebra display um, provides a threshold that you can set in your menu that uh, allows you to set a particular level of exposure and to be able to uh, reach that exposure level without going over. So uh, you could set your zebra to 100% or if you want to expose a certain skin tone anywhere from 50 to 70 to 80%. And these zebra patterns will show up in your viewfinder. They won't record but they'll show up in your viewfinder. It's kind of a corduroy effect or zebra effect that shows like, uh, for instance, both of these images show 100% uh, exposure. So when you would increase your exposure on your camera by opening up your lens or increasing your gain, and when you see the lines show up, that means you've reached that threshold. And so you would back off slightly on your exposure when you see those lines show up. So if you're opening up your lens and, and something white in the picture or something very bright starts to see the zebra pattern, uh, you're no, you know you're at that exposure level. So you just back off slightly until some or all of the lines disappear. And it's a great tool for making sure that you're well exposed on your image without uh, going, going over. Okay, the last thing that is used in cameras and is increasing in its popularity is called false color. And what the false color is, is a way of applying a, a color spectrum over the luminance part of your image. So like in the Ansel Adams zone that we looked at earlier, um, each zone of the exposure scale is represented by a color. And so by knowing what the color is representing a particular level of exposure or zone of exposure, you can tell um, how well your subject is exposed. Um, so this particular person here is probably slightly underexposed compared to, um, to normal exposure based on the color here. Also the color chart that's shown uh, over here is one based on log um, exposure so it's its tones are slightly lower than what you would get for for a standard what's called a rec 709 exposure scale uh, from 0 to 100 um, each manufacturer has a manual so when you get your camera manual um, it's a good idea always to read your manual uh, to get acquainted and really get to know your camera as well as possible. But uh, for those cameras that offer false color, each one has a chart that is basically the same, but it might be tailored for that particular camera. So the false colors I found to not be entirely universal, but sometimes specific to certain cameras. But if your camera offers this, it's a, it's a great way uh, setting your exposure, especially when you're doing things like interviews or getting shots of, of people and uh, you want to expose their skin tones consistently. It's a great device. Okay, so um, we're going to look at color temperature now. And co color temperature is um, using something called the Kelvin scale. And Kelvin um, was an engineer and physicist uh, from the early part of the, I think the early part of the century, the late, late 19th or early 20th century. Um, his name was William Thompson and he was the first Baron Kelvin. And so the Kelvin temperature scale was named after him and it had to do with basically when you heat metal, what the, the, as, the temp, as the metal heats, it gives off a different color and they came up with a temperature scale in order to explain that. And that same scale has carried over into photography. So um, here is the Kelvin scale. So again, getting back to that color of light, um, it, it's not always a white light. And depending on the situation you're in, the light color can vary. 
So um, for instance, uh, candle flame over here can be anywhere usually from about 1600 Kelvin to 1800 Kelvin. And so it gives off a very warm kind of a reddish orange and yellow, yellow light. And so you would set your camera, a lot of them you can have custom um, color temperatures that you can set. Other ones have, have uh, symbols that they use. Um, either one will get you into the ballpark. And you can also do custom uh, white balancing with a lot of cameras as well. So household lamps, uh, the typical lamps that are in your living room or bedroom, uh, quite often have a, a very warm color temperature of roughly anywhere from 26 to 2800 degrees or 2700 degrees uh, Kelvin in our, in our ballpark. If you uh, shoot with studio lights or you go into the studio like our Metro East studio, uh, all of the lights in the studio are balanced to 3200K uh, basic stage lighting. And if you uh, look at your white balance scale on your camera, quite often you'll see a little light bulb uh, emanating brilliantly here. And that represents most often uh, 3200K, which would be uh, studio lighting. Uh, moving up from there, we have um, uh, the next one is, is Moonlight, which is usually around 4100K, which is kind of a greenish bluish color um, in comparison to what we consider white light. And the next one is fluorescent. And now fluorescent has changed, especially over the past decade. Um, most fluorescent lights up until maybe 10 years ago were usually around 4500K and very, very green. <laughs> so if you had your white balance set down here to 3200K and you went in and exposed to under fluorescent lighting, your people's faces would often come out with a greenish cast, white walls would have a greenish cast. And in a lot of older buildings and warehouses and gymnasiums, they're still using older uh, fluorescent light fixtures and they still give off this, this greenish color of 4,500K. More modern fixtures can range anywhere um, for indoor lighting from 3,200 to about 3,500K, and something what they call a, a neutral white, which is around 4,000K, on up to daylight, which is 5,600K. And so coming to the, the 5,600K, most camera flashes that you use if you have a still camera will expose the light at a color of 5600K or basic daylight color, an average daylight color. Um, there is, a, if your camera again has symbols for white balance, it would look like a little sun there and that represents about 5600K. Uh, getting up on the scale, if the sky is overcast or there are some shadows around, um, overcast skies with lots of clouds, a cooler temperature than the warm sunlight. So uh, an overcast sky quite often is 6,500 degrees Kelvin or higher, um, depending on the situation. I've, uh, I was doing some testing with, with auto white balancing just to see how varied um, my camera would, would show um, an outdoor shot. And it went everywhere from actually a little bit below 5,600K to over to nearly 7,500K. So there's, there can be a big variance in, in outdoor lighting, uh, depending on whether it's a clear sky or a cloudy day, or there's a lot of shadows. Okay, and, and the, around the top here, uh, if you're in a situation where you're shooting off of a, like an LCD screen or a plasma screen or a video projector, you'll notice that compared to the rest of the room, um, now your eye looks at it and, it and it looks like a normal picture, but when you shoot it with your camera, especially like if you're in a studio setting and you have your camera set to say 3200K, when you shoot that off that monitor, everything is very, very blue. And that's the reason uh, why on the scale, it shows LCD and, and uh, most video projectors are anywhere from 6500K all the way up to nearly 10,000K. Um, so the 6500Ks are ones that can be calibrated. They're more professional monitors and they can be calibrated, calibrated to 6500K for things like color grading and such uh, to provide a consistent light level. 
uh, that can be matched with with overhead some overhead lighting but they do vary a lot and if you ever wondered why your tv turns out really blue on screen uh, that's why okay uh, let's see here it doesn't always want to change okay white balancing so again white balancing is taking something that looks um, where the color's off, uh, sometimes subtly, sometimes very noticeably, and it is a way of bringing it into balance when you use your camera. So it's always good if you can to, when you're setting up your camera and going to do a shoot, that you bring along a white card, like that collapsible one that I showed you, or a white piece of poster board or a piece of typing paper, or something that's white that can be held up in front of the camera and properly white balanced. And this is something that can be corrected for the most part in post-production, but it's always best in best practices to try to do that when you are um, on location. Okay, here's some tools to assist in setting up the white balance. Uh, the gray card, the, the white card, and the color chart. And with the exception of the neutral density filters, these are the same tools that you use uh, to aid in exposure as well. So these are really, really handy, and I, I highly recommend, at the very least, um, the gray card and white card combo. Uh, the chip, the color checkers can be considered expensive with a small uh, kind of wallet-sized version going over about $100 to $120 to the larger one, like in the picture, can be several hundred dollars. They're very precision printed. They have specific uh, sets, um, amounts of reflectivity and color saturation. So they, they're at very high tolerances and they can be often very expensive, but uh, quite often well worth the price. Okay, now we're getting into the scopes. So we're getting into the, the post-production part of color correction and figuring out what do all these things mean? So um, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see something called a waveform monitor. And what the waveform monitor does is it measures the video signal from the darkest uh, dark, the uh, pure black, all the way up to peak white and sometimes even above. And the scale will go anywhere from, it can be a, a number scale that is um, like a digital scale would be from zero to, to 255 or zero to 1,023. Uh, it depends on the, the bit depth of the image. Eight bits ha has uh, uh, fewer steps than say 10 bit, which is the 1,024 that is shown up here in the corner. Um, and you can also go 12 bit, which would be uh, 2,000, zero to 2,040, uh, let's see, no, sorry, 4,096. So zero to 4,095 would be a 12 bit and on up, depending on the bit depth of the image. Uh, the higher the bit uh, depth that your camera can record, the more color and exposure you can get out of it. But that's, that's, for, that's way beyond <laughs> uh, this, this lesson. So we'll, that's for another time. Okay, uh, to its right, we have the vector scope. And what the vector scope does is it, um, reads the amount of color in the image and uh, the value and saturation. And down below that you have a histogram. Histogram is like what we saw with the, the camera exposure one at the top. We have the luminance and then we have each color channel, the red, the green, and the blue. And then again with the RGB parade, red, green, and blue. Uh, and these are all, they can all work together or separately to help you do an effective um, color correction or color grade. Okay, the first one is the waveform monitor. So you'll see that, um, again, pure black at the bottom at the zero scale, darker tones, mid-tones are in this area, highlights up in this area, and then peak white is anything 100 or above. So with standard video like broadcast video or cable video, um, anything above 100 will be clipped. It will just be pure white and featureless. So anything you want to make sure that your signal is at or below that peak level, 
as well as the bottom part of your signal, the darkest areas you don't want to, you want it to barely touch zero but not go below. Okay, here is the same scale, the, um, the zone that we looked at before, Ansel Adams uh, zone system applied to the waveform monitor. So you can see that absolute black with no detail is at and below this zero line with steps of gradual increasing exposure and detail making its way to the top of the scale until you reach that 100% line and then everything above that is clipped or detailless peak white. Um, here we have the vector scope again. And again, it measures the chrominance portion of the video signal. Uh, it displays the hue and saturation of the colors present in the picture. So um, you'll see some target areas here. Uh, you have red, magenta, blue, cyan, green, and yellow. These are targets and these will be explained over the next few steps. So if we use a, a color bar, this is known as a simply color bar. And what the SMPTE color bar does is provides a test pattern that can be used to uh, set up a baseline or to calibrate your scopes to make sure that they're reading correctly. And you'll notice on the vector scope that each one of these bars represents a different color and a different target. And so kind of the rule of thumb when you're doing color correction or, or even your color grading is there's a legal limit to the amount of color that you can have in your picture. And these lines here my, marking these dots are the legal limit of what's acceptable for things like that are on broadcast and cable. Uh, you can sometimes go beyond these uh, limits um, if you're doing things like maybe on YouTube or, or some other venue. Uh, but this is considered the legal limit for color saturation. And so when you are doing your, your color calibration and color correction, you wanna make sure that your colors don't go beyond these targets, if at all possible. And again, here are the uh, three of the color regions, the, um, the yellow, red, and magenta, followed by blue, cyan, and, and green. So the vector scope, uh, one other neat thing with the vector scope is it has within its display something called the flesh tone line. And what the flesh tone line does is it allows you to accurately represent uh, a correct flesh tone. And this is something that's used across the scale uh, it doesn't matter if the person is Caucasian or a person of color, all of the flesh tones will fall upon that particular line. There's just maybe some differences in, in uh, luminance or saturation, but they all uh, will fall on that basic scale. And again, this is the flesh tone line. It's about maybe at a, uh, if this were a clock, it would be maybe at the 1030 area here. Um, and it's present on, on most vector scopes. Some scopes, you can turn it on and off. I always leave it on because I, I, I find that a very useful tool. And it's great for, again, arriving at an ideal flesh tone. Okay, the histogram, again, this is similar to what was in the camera display. And this is the same one we we're looking at before. I'm gonna add some more information to it here. So, Again, the, uh, the histogram is used to judge or manipulate exposure. If you're, if you're shooting with your camera, you can use it um, to average out or, or keep your exposure within limits so you don't go over or under. Um, and again, these zones represent, these are the shadow areas here. In the middle, you have midtones, and over on the right side, you have highlights. And the, the height, of each of these represents the amount of pixels over here that, that are in that particular tonal region. So there are many more pixels in this lower midtone, upper shadow region than there are say in the midtone areas. And again, more pixels in the highlights, uh, not a lot in the midtones, but when you get to the lower end of the midtones and the shadow areas, you see an increase 
and then kind of a fall off and then down toward pure black you see an increase again. So this is a great way of again measuring not only your exposure but how many pixels are affected the, the uh, percentage of your your picture is is affected by a particular tonal range. Again here is the uh, overlaid underneath is the scale the um, the zone system by Ansel Adams and how it pertains. You have absolute black to your left here with no detail, peak white with no detail, and then this tonal range in between that your scale covers. So when you're exposing with your camera, um, if this mountain peak, if you increase your exposure and it moves over here and you start to see this line show up, this bright line show up, that means that you've that part of the brightest parts of your picture will be clipping or in, be in danger of overexposing. And the, and the further you move this mountain peak over, the brighter your image will be. And the trick is to try to get this as close to this line as possible for optimum exposure without hitting this line. So as long as this peak or this line stays away from this 100% mark, then you have good exposure and everything in the picture can be recovered and used for good color correction. And again, here is just the scale down below um, showing the zone system as compared to the histogram. Okay, the fourth scope we're looking at is the RGB parade. And this is really a great, great display and it's, I use it a lot for balancing my um, image for doing white balancing. Um, there are ways, several ways to white balance. And my favorite way uh, to white balance a shot in post is to use the RGB parade. And so we'll get into that when we do the live demo of, of uh, the softwares. So the RGB parade, it, it breaks the, the color components. The color components that make up white light are uh, red, green, and blue, as far as the video signal. Uh, those are the primary component colors. And you can see by looking at this scale that the red component, there's, there's a lot less red than there is green and blue. So uh, even without seeing the picture, I can tell that the color cast is, is primarily blue and it's not in balance. So the ideal way of having the scope read would be where say if green was here around the 768 mark that the blues peak would be the same area and the red would be moved up and occupy the same area so these would look virtually the same on the same level and that would give you a proper color balance and we'll get into that when we get into the software demos Okay, so um, reviewing what we've learned so far with this, um, being able to understand the difference between what color correcting and color grading is, uh, the importance of shooting in manual versus white balance uh, or, or auto white balance and auto exposure, the exposure triangle, uh, hopefully the Kelvin temperature scale makes a little more sense. And if you've never heard of it before, then I hope, I hope you, uh, you have a, a basic understanding of what it means and how it applies. Um, uh, and basics of, of white balancing your camera. Uh, now, we didn't really get into sp the specifics of the camcorders and DSLRs and smartphones, but they all have controls. And again, um, getting to know your camera the best way possible, digging into that menu structure. And uh, some cameras have switches on the outside that can aid in auto white balancing um, or, or manual white balancing your camera. And other ones go through a menu setup. So whichever way works, um, most, most of them can do it. My Android phone can certainly be um, color balanced. And um, it, while I don't shoot a lot with my, with my phone, it, it comes in handy sometimes. But definitely with my DSLR and camcorder, it, it's, uh, it's great to be able to set the manual exposure and white balance. Okay, the last thing was uh, how to read scopes and I hope everybody has a grasping of what is available. And I, I don't remember, uh, Seth, if the links were sent out, or the, were the links sent out before the... Um... No, but I, okay. can, 
I can send all of that out. So we'll do like okay. a follow up email sure. that will also have the um, recording of this event. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll send out those links to so people can just have access to them and it'll all be in one tidy little package. Okay. So um, if anybody has any questions, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop the screen share uh, here for this first part. Um, does anybody have any questions with, of anything that we've covered so far? Is everybody good? Is everybody hanging in there? No, they're not. They're <laughs> lying. There are questions in people's heads. Come on, guys, pipe up. Un unmute your mic or put okay. it into the into the group chat. We, we're happy to a, answer these. I, I, I can't guarantee I can answer every question, but I'll give it my best shot. I got a question. Okay. What is the, the like the real difference? I missed that part between color grading and color correction. Okay, uh, color correction is basically uh, what it boils down to is where you take your raw footage and you bring it in and you basically equalize it. You, you provide, um, you balance the color. So if, if the color balance is off, like if something, a building that's white is, is actually showing, coming off as slightly warm or slightly blue, you can make that correction uh, to, to neutralize the color and bring the exposure within the acceptable range from your highlights down to your darkest shadows. And then the color grading is the creative um, coloration or exposure that you do after you've done your color correction. So uh, like what's popular now and has been popular for the past several years is the, what's called the teal and orange effect uh, for movies and a lot of the TV shows. Um, in, in the normal workflow, you would bring your raw footage in, you would provide color correction to that first, and then you would provide, you would, you would apply the, the creative uh, application of color grading on top of that to get your final look that, that makes the mood or the tone of your, of your scene. I hope that explains it. Thank you, it does. Okay. Yeah, there's, um, if anybody's ever seen Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? There's a really good behind the scenes video where they they show they get this kind of like real dusty kind of look that they apply to it that it, it looks kind of faded and old timey it's pretty cool so any other questions anything about uh, the stuff that we've covered so far I hope everybody's hanging in there I know that that can be kind of dry as some of you have probably already uh, were aware of a lot of that but since this is the intro it's good to have that foundation to really know how this stuff works and, and how by, by, by shooting with the idea of color correcting, uh, you can be much more effective and have a much better result um, by understanding and having that foundation and building upon that. Tony, I think we had, we had another question. Kat, okay. now, is it you or I'm trying to- Yeah, I was curious if there was, if you knew of any tips or tricks to like making a DIY color card. Um, or if it's just better to just throw down the bucks and just buy one. Well, um, the thing with these, these color cards and let me, um, I'm going to turn off my background here because I want to hold up this card. So I'm going to turn off my background. You can see my sofa and wall behind me. Okay. Um, this is a chip chart that's made by x -Rite. And this is the same one that was in the, the video. This is a very large one. Uh, there are smaller ones that are that are called passport ones. They're about the size of a of a passport, um, and these are are printed. It's a very expensive and very precise process to to create these, and they have a certain level of reflectance for the highlights, the midtones, the dark areas, and the the absolute uh, dark areas, as well as things like the uh, the flesh tone areas and and the bold colors, and these are considered kind of industry standard for setting up and calibrating your color. Um, there may be cheaper ones out there, and I don't know if, if a do-it-yourself version, how close that would compare uh, to this, but, um, but these are, are really handy. And if you can afford even, even the smaller one, the passport version, uh, it can be really beneficial to you. The opposite side is, is a white card. So if you need to do a white balance, uh, with your camera, you can flip it over and use that if you need a full white background. And I think the white on here is about 90%. So if you, um, if you 
exposed to it, you want to um, maybe set your zebra levels or in, on your scope or histogram to where it comes out at about 90% uh, for this, this white. It wouldn't be absolute peak white. Um, I'll show you the little collapsible gray card that I have, a gray and white card. It comes in a little patch, pouch like this. It's about maybe, I don't know, four inches across. And these are only $7.50 to $8 on Amazon. And I think there's a link provided. And these are really terrific because they, they just pop open like this. And you have a gray card that you can set in front of your camera and it gives you uh, a good way of, of exposing, uh, the, getting the exposure level for your camera as well as being able to flip it over and do your white balance. So it kind of takes care of both things. And this gets you in the ballpark. Even without the color chart, this, this will do really well for getting you in the ballpark for being able to do really effective color correction in post. And um, I, I have several of these. I have several cameras. I have a still camera, uh, DSLR, uh, camcorder, and a, a pocket cinema camera. And all of these in the camera bags have, have one of these cards, whether or not I have my, my X-Rite color checker with me. Really, really handy and very inexpensive real lifesavers. So any other questions? I have a question. Okay. I was wondering if more about the legal limits for saturation, like mm -hmm. that I'd never really heard of that before. Um, but why exactly is that? Okay. Um, that goes back to the broadcast television days. Um, before even well actually it includes cable and and modern broadcasting um there is a certain limit to how bright a picture can be within a particular tv standard and how much how saturated the colors can be to be what's called within a legal limit it's like a i mean you you are aware of speed limits uh with your car how fast you can drive well there are there are legal limits for how bright your picture can be and how saturated the colors can be. And what those scopes reveal to you is allows you to uh, grade your, or, or correct your, your footage to where the final output of your video falls within those, those legal limits. And some rules are made to be broken, and like if you're not, if you're not submitting to broadcast or cable, uh, you probably don't have a lot to worry about, but it's, it's, it's a good practice to at least know what, the, what those limits are. Um, th does that, does that help? I guess, I, I guess partially, is it just like, uh, making a standard for reproduction quality or? In a, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, it keeps your colors from, from bleeding. Uh, th this isn't really that much of a problem in the digital age and the, anal in the analog age of TV. It was a real problem if, if the, if the picture went above uh, 100 units of brightness or the colors were oversaturated, you'd get a loud humming or buzzing in the, in the video portion. That doesn't really happen with, with digital images, but you can still clip the digital images to where colors are so saturated that they actually lose all detail and they become kind of blown out. Or where, like if you take a picture of a flower uh, like a rose or something that's that's really bright red, and you turn the color up too high, you'll lose all of the detail on those flower petals uh, that are there. Whereas if you're in, within the legal limits, you can not only see the color, but also the texture uh, that's within that color. I have and, a, uh, a question as well. I, uh, sure. I don't want to interrupt though. No, it's fine. So uh, my question is, um, I, I think I follow everything so far in terms of um, the exposure triangle and the histograms and okay. balancing things, but um, and maybe we're going to talk about this in the next part. So um, if that's the case, um, then I'll just sit back and, and relax. But um, I'm just wondering when I actually have my phone or my camcorder or whatever it is, um, and I have a, a fancy pop out color card or white white balance thing. Um, how does that process actually work? Am I like looking at the zebras and the histograms on my um, phone or on my camcorder and then like turning down the f stop a little bit and tweaking like how does that part actually work? Maybe it's device specific yeah it well each each device can have a different way of of measuring exposure or white balance. Um, 
like my particular, my, my black magic camera um, has false color and a histogram and zebras that does not have a waveform monitor or vector scope. But by using those, those three components, uh, any of them I can use basically to set exposure and I, and for more precise exposure, the combination of them can be really helpful. Um, so yeah, if depending on your camera, not, and some cameras, um, some camcorders that, that come out there are, are probably may not even have the option of manual settings. Some of them right out of the box might be auto everything and you can still make an effective, um, do effective correction or, or grading with those. But again, it's kind of a wild card because as the picture changes, the exposure and the white balance will constantly change depending on what the content is. If someone's in front of the camera and they have a red shirt and they step out or someone with a blue shirt enters, the color's gonna shift because it'll see an overabundance of blue from the red and try to shift the color the opposite way to come up with what it thinks is the right balance. And, and also all cameras in auto mode, if you're exposing an automatic, um, Nirvana to a sensor a, for auto exposure is neutral gray. So if, if you've ever shot, like if you've shot a performance on a stage and you have the dark stage and a spotlight and you go to shoot it in auto mode, the person on the stage is when the, that spotlight hits them, they're blown out. Everything else is dark, but that person on the stage is blown out. Um, that's because the sensor inside the camera, it wants to create everything as a neutral image. It wants that middle gray exposure. So if you take your camera and it's in auto mode and you point it at a, a black card uh, or, a, or, a, or a very, very dark picture, it's going to try to expose it as gray. If you point it at something white uh, that's very bright or has a lot of uh, sunlight or anything like that, it's going to try to reduce the exposure down and again, expose that as middle gray. It's tr trying to average it out. Same thing with the color balance. It's always trying to average it out. And if you put the two together, then you have this constantly shifting um, variable that's going on rather than that consistent line of exposure. When you have something manual and you lock it in, you have a consistent line of exposure and you have a consistent line of white balance that then you can go in and manipulate and raise or lower those values. And again, those will stay consistent through the scene. Okay, so how are we all doing? Does, does anybody need a break or anything uh, before we get into the, the software demo part? Anybody need to take two or three or anything? Or should we move on? I, I pardon me. I have uh, one more question. Sure, um, the, uh, I've, I've done a couple of different um, uh, filming of local events and stuff uh, in my community and often try, tried to do multi-camera setups mm -hmm. and based on whatever I had set the cameras to, because they were of different make, each camera came out at a different hue. Right. And it, I ended up, uh, you know, waving the white flag and uh, asking someone that actually, uh, I know from college that did color correction mm -hmm. and asked him to manage something. But um, what it, what is like the best practice if you're using multiple cameras, what, what do you do to perhaps help that along in the color correction in the post at least? Okay. Um, probably the best thing you can do is again, the x right color chart, this guy here. If you get a, get a, get this in the shot in front of each one of the cameras uh, under the lighting conditions and the exposure conditions that you're shooting under, uh, this chart can help in matching the color and brightness and exposure between the, the different cameras. Thing is, is that uh, each, each make of camera, uh, Canon cameras are often reproduce a flesh tone as slightly warm or slightly magenta. Uh, Panasonic cameras can often be slightly green or yellow in what the, how they reproduce a flesh tone. Uh, Sony cameras are sometimes in between. Um, Airy cameras like the Airy Alexa, um, it has one of the most consistent flesh tones in the industry. That's why I think everybody that does TV and movies now wants to shoot with those because they, 
they deliver not only a beautiful uh, color image, but very, very consistent flesh tones. So uh, again, the one thing you can do um, if you have access to a chart or can even get the smaller one, uh, get a quick shot of this in front of each camera. And then in, in post, you can uh, match these colors up together. So from the different cameras, if you can get these colors to match, then you can not totally guarantee, but come really, really close to where you can cut between them and not tell that they're different makes of cameras. Um, anyway, that's, that's what I've had to do. Um, when I've been shooting with independent cameras, if you're shooting with a, with a system where all the cameras are tied together and you can actually shade them between each other. Like if you're shooting with a multi-camera, uh, mobile unit or something where they're all feeding into a switcher and you can, you can affect the color there. Um, uh, quite often it's easier to match up on location, but in your situation like this, if you're shooting with several different cameras, then having that color chart can really be a lifesaver when it comes to post and doing your post color correction. Okay, so um, we can move on to the, the first software demo. Um, then, and again, does anybody need a break for a minute or can, can we go ahead and move on into that? We good? Okay, I'm going to- We uh, have one break taker. What okay. if you're not taking a break, can we just stand up and stretch for just one moment? Sound good? There you go. Okay. Um, should we should we have Jessica Liu um, lead us in like a yoga flow, a vinyasa there you go. flow? Sure. Oh, my shoulders just popped. Oh, that feels good. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and open the first software package here, just so it's ready to go. Up, Will. Um, just so people know, um, and, and I'll make an announcement about this. Uh, there's two things that I wanna make an announcement about. Um, one is next week we're doing a make your own website class using Google Sites. So if you're interested in that, um, the information will be, be being mailed out pretty soon. Um, so go ahead and stay tuned for that. Um, and then we're also, we're asking people, we have something called the Your, um, Your Voice Survey, which is basically asking about what sort of technologies, especially around cable and internet that you have access to um, and what you need. Um, this is really important for us because it's part of how we get our funding. This data informs um, decisions that are made about whether we exist or not. So. Um, we're going to send out that survey. Uh, I'll send it out to the people that are in this um, in this group at the end of the workshop. And I'll just ask if you can please fill it out. It takes about 15 minutes. And I take it that some of you guys might have some time to kill. So um, <laughs> we'd really appreciate it. And it's very helpful to us. And then I'll stop jabbering, Tony. No problem. Okay, so are we, are we all set to move on? Hey, how you doing, Billy? <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and I'll share the screen again, and we'll move into our first first demo, which is um, Adobe Premiere. So we'll get into that. Okay. All right. Hopefully, everybody can see the interface. Um, this is some footage I pulled from many years ago from a family get together. And so I thought, wow, this, there's a couple of shots in here that, that would work really well, where you have basically the same person in a couple of different shots and, and under different lighting conditions. So um, I thought we'd start out here. So um, I'm going to go into the color palette. Okay. I'm going to scoot the little sidebar around so I can see things more clearly. All right, so um, can everybody see this? This is um, the Adobe Premiere. This is the, the color portion. Um, the color corrector of choice in Adobe Premiere is called Lumetri or Lumetri uh, color corrector. 
So we have a situation here where um, this was shot in the summertime. It's an outdoor setting. Uh, the sun has, I think, gone behind or gotten, gotten lower on the horizon and everything is kind of in a shadow. So what looked great in the sun is now kind of a, a blue cast. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, take a look at the exposure. And you can see up here that there are some really bright areas here in the sky that are really bright. The, this is fairly bright, the, the cake and the, and the paper plate. But you can still see some detail here. But up here in the sky, you can see, and if you look over at the waveform monitor that's over on this side, you can see that this line up here, everything is kind of scrunched up and nothing goes beyond that. Okay. So what's happening is the signal is being clamped. It's called, it's called being clamped. And you can see this little check mark down here is, is called clamped. And it's cutting it off at 100%. And that's to keep within the legal limit. So anything that's above this line is clipped off. So this bright area of the sky, it's, there's no detail up here in the sky that's being shown in the waveform. If I turn the clamping off, you can see that the exposure does eventually kind of clip up maybe 10% more. But there's still some detail up here that can be used uh, that's above 100% that's present in the signal, and we can make use of that. So I'm going to turn the clamp back on, and I'm going to adjust the, the exposure to try to bring that highlight level down at or below 100%. So I'm going to go down here. This is the Lumetri color corrector. I'm going to go down to my, my white adjustment here, and this raises and lowers the peak white level. And so what I'm going to do is this is the neutral area. I'm going to bring this down until I see some of the detail come back to where it drops just below that 100% line. So it looks like I can pull it down to right around there to where it's just under 100%. Now let's see, I'll, I'll nudge it down a little bit more. Just so it's below that top line, this 100% line. And some of it is still clipped, but also some of the detail, I was able to recover a little bit of detail. I can see a little more texture in the sky here uh, over her left shoulder. And so now we've got kind of a peak white level. So now I'm going to go to the, to the black level here. And we want to bring the darkest areas of the picture down to where they're just not quite touching, maybe just above that zero mark. So I'm going to bring this level down. And we're going to place this just right about where that zero mark is. Okay, so now we've got overall a good, expo a well exposed image. It's still kind of flat and still kind of blue. So, what we want to do is try to neutralize um, this effect. And so, one of the tools you can use, and it's, it's quite often pretty effective, is this little eyedropper here, uh, it's the white balance selector. So you click on that and it creates this little eyedropper and you hold it over part of the image that looks like it would be something that would be white. So it looks like the frosting on this cake is kind of a pure white. So I'm going to drop that there and you can see how the picture is suddenly warmed up now that it has a white balance. Uh, so basically what I did is I re-white balanced this shot in post uh, to bring out the rich color and it removes most of the, or all of that blue cast. So uh, that's a really handy tool and most systems have this. So if you're using Final Cut or um, Premiere or DaVinci or Sony Vegas, uh, these are mostly, I think, all, all uh, involved uh, and included in there. Although I haven't, I used to use Vegas many, many years ago and I haven't for quite a long time. So I'm not certain um, what, what tool set is offered, but I imagine it's, it's fairly state of the art. So uh, now we've got a, a kind of a good color balance here that looks, looks nice. And if we look over at the vector scope, you can see on the vector scope, 
that there's this red line toward the red target, and that looks like the shoulder of this guy here. And it's approaching but not exceeding this red line. And then there's also lots of green in the area. So you'll see uh, greens and uh, blues available. There's still some blues here. Okay. And so what we want to do with that is uh, we've done, we've gotten a, a fairly good um, overall color quality here. So ideally what we want to do now is make sure that our, since there's people in the shot, the flesh tones look pretty good, but let's just double check and see if we can make them look a little better. So um, I'm going to go over to my effect control. And under the effect control, you'll see things like uh, motion and opacity, and here's the color corrector. When I clicked on this image and I started doing things with the color corrector, it automatically dropped that color corrector onto the shot. So it shows up here uh, in the effects panel. So I want to isolate, um, ideally, his face from everything else so I can take a look at what that flesh tone line looks like. Because if you look at the scope, it's kind of hard to tell um, what you're seeing here because there's so many things in the picture. So we're going to try to isolate that. So I'm just going to go over to my opacity window and I'm going to click a mask. And I'm going to take the mask and I'll change the shape of it a little bit here. I'll bring it up and kind of just isolate his face from everything else in the picture. And then let's go back and look at that scope again. Okay, so it's kind of faint, but you can see here that there's, there's something going on. Um, so let's, just for grins, let's take our saturation control over here on the right side and let's push it up a little higher. And you'll see that it's really saturating his skin color. And so let's bring it up enough to where we can kind of clearly see where this meets the line here. So we can go up to the tint control and we can adjust that tint control. And as we do that, you'll see his face goes green or magenta. So what we want to do is kind of see if we can land it right on that line or close to it. So we'll put it there and we'll bring our saturation up. And that looks, that looks pretty close. That's pretty good. Maybe I might nudge it just the other way, a tiny bit. Okay, so, and then let's back off on the color and we'll take a look at how this looks. So we'll go back to the effect control. I'll just delete the mask and we get our picture back. And according to the scope that is a uh, closer to a, a normal flesh tone. So we have now we have a balanced picture that that has, if we look at the scopes, um, it's up to but not exceeding 100% on the brightness. It's going down but not breaking the 0% mark on the bottom. So you have dark areas like the belt and the shadow areas here. They're down in that toward the 0% and then the highlights in the sky. Now the one thing that that doesn't this this picture to me still looks kind of flat. It doesn't really pop, and especially if you want to try to get something that uh, you know everybody wants that film look. And so one thing that you can do to to really bring out and add some life and some punch to an image is by um, bringing up the mid tones. And there are several ways you can do that. And my favorite way, I mean, there are things like color wheels. Uh, you can go and adjust the mid-tones and the color wheels, and you can push those up, and it will bring up those mid-tones and kind of make things pop a little bit. But it's, it's, it's not really, it doesn't really give you a, a strong visual sense of what's going on uh, with that. So I'll, I'll reset that. And what I like to use that comes in really handy are the curves. And... This curve is a diagonal line. You can see there's a faint, it might be hard to see, but there's a faint grid here on the right side, kind of a checkerboard pattern. And this line represents the brightest bright all the way across to the darkest dark. 
And if I grab this line and move it this way, you're going to see that it can cause the picture to, to brighten up significantly, or if I drag it the other way, it can, it can darken it. And in addition to these broad strokes, you can also uh, do some very subtle corrections. So if I go down here to the middle, right around the mid-tone area, and I just nudge it just ever so slightly, you'll see that what looks kind of like a flat picture suddenly has a little more punch, it's a little more dynamic, has a little more uh, detail in those mid areas. And this is just like uh, stretching a bow, like a bowman stretching his bow this way, only it's, it's very, very subtle. So again, you can, underneath here you can see this blue line. That's the, the baseline for this control. And you can lower the contrast um, or increase it with this line. You can, you can push up dark areas if there's a lot of dark areas or you can pull down highlights with it. But all we're going to do is something really subtle. So I'll move it back to the middle here and I'll just push it up, just nudge it up a little bit. And now it looks like I may have pushed my brightness up slightly. So what I can do with that is I can grab this line here and I can pull it down. And this affects the overall brightness. So I can pull that highlight down, just, just nudge it ever so slightly, just to bring it down just, just a tiny bit to kind of make up for pushing up those mid-tones. My uh, dark areas look pretty good still. So this, this picture is pretty well balanced. It's got a good flesh tone. Um, there's nice details. None of the colors are blown out. The red on the shoulder here is still within the legal limit. Um, looks, looks pretty good. Okay. And so the shot, works pretty well. All right, same, some of the same people in this daylight shot. So this looks overall pretty good. Um, it looks like the whites might be a little bright. Some of them might be clipping and uh, there's some clouds up here. So um, again, from left to right, you can see these, these two really bright spots here that could coincide with the, these white shirts and a, and a big blotch over here, which is probably this white shirt. And then uh, a few things in between, probably the fellow with the, the blue and white stripes on his shirt are showing up here. So again, we'll do kind of the same thing. We'll go back to the basic correction. And we will start with the highlights. And so I'm just making sure that I'm selected here. And so the exposure looks pretty good. It doesn't like we, look like we have to bring that up. This is the exposure control, which you can use to kind of globally increase or decrease brightness. This has the same effect kind of, a, of like pushing your ISO up or down on camera. Um, it's an amplifier that can either increase the amount of signal or decrease the amount of signal. So I'm gonna kind of leave it where it's at and just if I can click on it here, put it back to zero again. All right. So um, let's go back and adjust our whites. So we're gonna pull these down and it looks like there's more detail there. So if we bring it down, you can see that the shirts are still white, but you can see a little more detail. They're not as clipped or crushed as they were. So we're gonna pull that down just below that 100% line. And again, we're going to check our dark areas here and we'll adjust our black level to where it goes down and nearly touches, but doesn't exceed that zero line there. So that's probably the dark shadow areas around here in the frame uh, falling in, in there. Okay, um, flesh tones again, uh, flesh tones look pretty good. We can just double check those if we want. So we can go to the effect control. We can click our mask again. And this big pointer is, it can be a little clumsy sometimes. So I'm going to Kind of shape this around here just to isolate that flesh tone. Come on, there we go. Oops. Yeah, let's see if I can get. Okay, this can be a little tricky sometimes. I made the mouse pointer bigger so it'd be more visible for this, but the downside is is that <laughs> it's like having really big fingers trying to do delicate work. 
it can make it tough sometimes. Okay, so uh, we have the flesh tone isolated. Let's go to the scope. And wow, look at that. Um, because it's in the sunlight, of course, there's much more saturation. It's a little bit bolder. And, but you can clearly see that this is just about nailing that flesh tone line here. So um, we're going to adjust, to adjust the tint ever so slightly, just, just to nudge it over a tiny bit here to where it's pretty close to centered on that line. And just nudge it over. Okay, then let's go back to the effect control, turn off our mask. And that's looking pretty good. So again, um, we can try to pop the mid-tones. The mid-tones look actually pretty good on here. It looks like there's a lot of, of material in the, in the, in the tones, uh, the mid-tones. Um, we can go back to curves and try adjusting that. Uh, but I, I think that probably overall they're, they're good as they are. Yeah, I might nudge it just just a just a tiny bit. Let me I'll reset it here, and then we'll just give it a give it a little nudge. But overall, I th I think that was pretty good. Um, when you have bright sunlight, it of course increases contrast. Uh, you have a lot of highlight and shadow detail, and there's just a lot uh, a more abundance of of that direct specular light. So it really makes textures um, and details pop, as opposed to very diffuse light. So um, it's, it's pretty close and pretty good. So that's a nice, well-balanced shot. Okay, so um, we, let's uh, go over, I'm gonna go back to my edit screen and we're going to go to our flesh tone, um, our model here from, um, that I pulled off the internet from Creative Commons. Um, she's available. Uh, royalty free and, and, and license free to be able to use. And so since she has such an ideal flesh tone, I like to use her for, for things like calibrating or practicing getting a, a good flesh tone. Um, so we can look at the scopes. So I need, to click, I need to click on that to activate it. And we're gonna go back to the color. And you can see that that flesh tone is, is clearly visible here on the line. So if we go to the effect control and we click our, our shape here and we create, we isolate her flesh tone pretty much and look back at the scope that that, that, really, um, that really nails that flesh tone line. And let's see, there's a little bit of red there. So we'll get rid of that red lips and you can see there that's pretty well isolated. So that right on that flesh tone line. Okay. So we'll get rid of that. And again, um, we have a, a lady here, a person of color, and it's the same thing. Um, this is the amazing thing is, so if I, if I go in and I have her selected, I go in and create a mask, and I apply that mask, You'll see that when we go back to the scope, right on that flesh tone line. Okay, here's something that's really interesting. I found this out many years ago when I, when I did a, a holiday uh, program. So uh, let's go back to the effect control. I'll turn off the mask. And uh, look at the scopes again. This image is really... Uh, this is another image I, I pulled off the uh, Creative Commons, and whoever did the balancing and the color correcting on this did a really outstanding job, considering there's this bright white background here. There's great tonalities going through the hair and the skin tones, and everything is just right. So whoever did this, my, my, uh, my hat's off to you, because everything falls within the legal limits, the colors are all good. They're coming up. They're a little bit past the 75%, uh, but still not exceeding the 100% level here. So all's well and good. That's, that's a great looking image. Okay, so here's, here's something interesting that I discovered. Look at this, these pumpkins. Um, look at the flesh tone line. Um, 
and I've discussed this with other, other people, basically, if you boil it down, we're all orange. <laughs> we're all pumpkins. And because pumpkins almost exactly nail this flesh tone line. And so uh, I, I just thought that was something really interesting that everything fall, falls on that. So anyway, um, so we've looked at Adobe Premiere. Uh, the reason I, I did Premiere first is for some reason on, on a Macintosh, um, any Adobe app loads really, really slowly. Um, on my PC, which I do most of my editing on at home, uh, I can launch an Adobe app like Premiere and it launches within 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, for some reason, uh, whether it's a, a, a MacBook Pro or uh, a, one of the Power Macs or Mac Pros, you can go out to coffee literally uh, in the time it takes to launch uh, Adobe Premiere. Sometimes I've waited up to 20 minutes for it to launch, and I, I don't know why that is. Uh, once it's open, it works great, but just that launching sequence seems to take forever. So uh, anyway, aside from that anecdote, um, we can I'm go ahead and close Premiere out. Uh, before I do, though, does anybody have any questions about Premiere? Yes, I, Stephanie. Um, I had a question, I guess um, it could be specific to Premiere okay. or any, but um, so the way you were color correcting those images, that's for that clip, that, that, that's just like a still frame of one clip, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so then that whole clip will play out with those adjustments. Yes. Um, yeah. And then if, if you, so say you had a whole scene of clips. Right. Like, would you need to do this color correcting on all the footage before you edit it down? Or could you then like, sort of like copy and paste the color correcting, like, adjustments to the clips that were shot in the same that that's a light. great question yes you can uh, if you have a lot of shots that are that are of us of a similar in the environment that and the, the exposure stays the same and the white balance stays the same um, you can grade that very first shot and then copy and paste those attributes um, so you can copy like the attributes from this clip and if the other clips were of, were of a similar nature, you could paste that color grade, those attributes onto the other clips. And probably for many times you can get away without doing any further adjustments. And so if you have a range of clips that are all shot under the same conditions of color and exposure, you can grade the first one and then apply that color grade to the other ones. Um, and I, I've had the situation where I've had to do no further work on uh, a series of shots that were all shot in the same environment. Sometimes you have to go in and make little tweaks to some of the other shots. But um, yeah, you can globally affect a whole scene just with that first grade. So that's a, that's a great question. I have one second question. Sure. Um, so you gave the example earlier with the question about filming on multiple cameras and yes. about how the footage comes up with like a slightly different um, color balance yes about using the color card like getting a shot of the color card um at the beginning of that filming yeah so say you had the three different cameras like how how would you actually do that like in the timeline or in premiere so mm -hmm. say okay you've got a still frame on each of the shots that have the color card on it like what's your work path the most okay. efficient way to balance those two or three okay. color cards with each other. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, you would bring in and, and you would probably have that color chart at the head of a particular shot or maybe the shot preceding your main shot. So you'd impact, import that into your timeline for each camera and you would take that particular shot and you would, and again, you'd put that up so it shows up. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think I have a shot of the, I, I should have done that. I should have had the, the chip chart um, available for this. Um, that's, that's considered a little more advanced and that's kind of beyond the scope of this intro, but that's still a really good question. So um, I would bring that into the timeline and um, 
and use the vector scope and the waveform. So we would go back into the color. Oops, come on. It just covered up my, the little menu covered up my, um, my thing here. There it goes. Okay. So um, you'd use your, again, that vector scope. So your chip chart would kind of look like, uh, let me go back to my editing. I have to be very careful not to touch that upper menu because it'll cover it up. Okay, I, have, I do have that color bar shot here. So um, you'll see how it hits these targets. And now if I affect this, these color bars, um, like if I go into the basic controls or let's see, let's go to the color wheels. Um, you'll see that as I affect these, these colors that it changes where everything falls on the scope. Like if I push it this way, you'll see the targets change. Um, you can affect each one of those colors and get those as close to landing on those targets as possible by using that, that camera color chart. And once you achieve that with each camera, um, and you get those lined up where the red falls within the red and the green falls within the green and, and so on. Um, that'll make your, your different cameras look very, very similar. Maybe not exact, but, but close enough um, by reproducing that, that color chart. Good question. Does that, does that help answer that? Okay. So um, is everybody good with Premiere? I know our time's getting down there, and um, so I'll jump in and do a really quick um, demo of Final Cut, and then we'll go on to Resolve. So um, once I quit Premiere, it's not coming open again anytime soon. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close that. Okay, so I can close this too. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to launch Final Cut at the bottom here. So, okay, I've got a few shots preloaded in here. And these were some stuff, this is some stuff I shot down along the Columbia River. It's a couple of barges. Um, this was shot with a Blackmagic camera and it was shot in a log or raw format. So the color's pretty washed out. The picture's very, very flat. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use uh, some of the color controls to, to bring that up. So um, I'm gonna move my little pictures here around. Okay, so um, first thing we wanna do in Final Cut, you have different workspaces that you can use. So we want to go to a window and we want to go to the color and effects layout. And you'll see that these scopes pop up. And now we have our waveform, our RGB overlay, our parade, and our vector scope. So what we'll want to do is we want to correct the shot. So I've selected the clip. Let's move it over here. And then um, let's go up. We'll select our color controls, and one thing that's kind of unique to Final Cut is the color board. And so um, with exposure here, I can affect, um, I have a master control to affect the overall exposure. I have uh, shadows, midtones, and highlights just by grabbing the different items here. Um, I can affect that. So um, if I wanna try to bring the highlights up, I can select highlights and bring those levels up close to. Now you'll notice the scale goes up to 120. And again, we want to take it up close to 100% without going over. And then I want to take the shadow tones or, or this control right here when I click on it and drag this down to where it just almost touches, but not quite the zero part. Now <clears throat> you'll notice that um, this is the RGB parade and we talked about that before and this is really handy for color balancing. So what we can do with that and I'll show you another control option um, 
We have color wheels, which can again affect uh, just like the ones in Premiere. Uh, you have your luminance values. You can raise and lower these. Um, you can affect uh, color. This is master color. You can increase or lower the color here, or you can adjust the color balance of different parts of your picture. Okay, these all work about the same, but what I want to show you is something that's really cool. And this goes back to the curves like we used in um, Premiere uh, to adjust the contrast or to provide that punch to the midtones. So you'll see that um, what, what our goal is is to get these all about the same. So the brightness of the blue, we can see that there's more red and green than there is blue in the picture. So what we want to do is bring that blue level up. So each line here has a color component. So um, if I grab this and drag it, it's going to raise that blue level up and only the blue level. It's, you'll see it's not really affecting the other colors or it's not affecting them very much. And now that blue level is nearly the same. It looks like the red might be a little bit hot compared to the blue and the green. So I'm going to bring it go up to the red level. I'm going to actually pull it down slightly. If I can grab it. There we go. Okay. I'm going to pull that down here. And now the white is pretty neutral. Anything white in the picture or gray in the picture is fairly neutral. You can see even there, I don't think I have to do much. I might pull the blue down just a little bit on the bottom area here. Just a touch. Okay. So now the color is pretty neutral. I've got um, good contrast. I might bring up my peak level so I can actually go up to the luminance part and drag this over this way and it will raise all of the colors kind of uniformly up to close to that 100% mark. So there I've recovered that. Okay, now I can go back and I can go back to my color board or color wheels. I'll go back to the color board, click saturation and then I can bring up my overall, let's go to the midtones and oh, well, let's, let's go to master and just bring up the saturation to add some more punch. So here I'm bringing some life back into this shot. Okay, this was shot on kind of a, a slightly overcast day so the colors are not gonna be really bold and vibrant. Um, so this is probably pretty close to what it looked like. There's also a little bit of haze in the air so I, I'm not gonna get the full contrast um, that would be on a sunny day. And you asked uh, Stephanie earlier about copying and pasting uh, one clip to another. So I'm going to take, there's another shot here that's, that's similar where the, the tug and the barge are moving past. So let's see what we get. Um, let's select this. I'm going to click uh, Command C on, on the Mac here. There's no PC version because Final Cut's only available on the Mac. And then I'm going to go over and click this other shot and go up and go to edit and uh, paste attributes. And that's going to take that color correction we did on the first shot and it's going to apply it to the second shot. And yes, I want the color board, color wheels and color curves all to be applied. And we'll see what we get. So again, that looks pretty consistent. It looks like the, the brightness level changed somewhat between the two shots, but overall the color and saturation are pretty, pretty darn close. Uh, some of the, the, the water maybe is a little bit bluer in this shot because of the angle, the incident angle. Um, the, this is reflecting white clouds and the angle has changed slightly so the water's bluer but it's, it's very, very close. So the, you'd only need to make minor tweaks um, to the image to make these match up. And as you, as you see, the brightness level up here is, as the tug comes over, you see that brightness level come up. It looks like it's, it's breaking the 100% level a little bit. So what I might do is go over um, to the color controls and just go back to the color board or let's, let's do the color wheels this time and just pull that exposure back down ever so slightly just to put it below that 100% mark. 
And it looks like the sun is starting to peek out a little bit. So I'm seeing a few kicks from the sunlight that weren't in this, this shot here. So it looks like the lighting conditions may have changed. But with a little work, you can get these to match pretty closely. Okay, everybody good with uh, the basics on Final Cut? I know we didn't cover everything we did in Premiere, but is, is everybody got a basic understanding of, of that? Okay, so um, we've got a few minutes left. Let's, let's jump into uh, DaVinci. All right. So I need to move a few things around here and we'll hit resolve. Love DaVinci Resolve. Actually, um, with full disclosure, I, I kind of had to relearn Final Cut a little bit to do this demo because I moved away from it a few years ago. Um, I'm platform agnostic, so I, it doesn't really matter to me whether I'm working on a PC or a Mac. And I really like to be able to transfer. Like at Metro East, nearly every, all the machines we have are, are Macintoshes. And at home, I have this hand-built uh, PC that I use. Um, oh, I hope that's not all offline. Okay. Um, hmm. My drive is connected. I'm not quite sure why it says it's offline. I checked it before we did the program here. So let me um, quickly try to relink these clips. Um, Okay, there we go. All right, we've got a, several things here. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go to my master here and let's, let's do this white balance thing. Come on, there we go, okay. So I've got a couple of shots here, um, <clears throat> unfortunately featuring yours truly. Uh, during this coronavirus thing, it's hard to find models to, uh, <laughs> to participate in doing these shots. So I had to do this on my own. So um, we're gonna quickly just step through the controls here and, um, and show how to, how to do some things in Resolve. So I'm gonna go over to the color page and you'll see a lot of the familiar things. You'll see uh, the color wheels, the, um, the curves and histogram. And over on the side here, you'll see the RGB parade. Again, I love the RGB parade. So um, what we're going to do is I'm gonna show you, um, the color wheels all work basically the same. Uh, and let me decipher some of these for you. Lift is your black levels, gamma is your midtones, gain it or your highlights and then offset is like the master in the one we looked at at final final cut it affects everything globally um and kind of like what final cut and premiere offer only more advanced is this curve section here so again this was shot inside uh under warm white balance but still not as warm as the interior was here so what we want to do is neutralize this so I'm going to um, affect each color independently. We want to get these on the same level. So this is mixing all colors together. And so I want to address each color independently. So I can click this and let's bring up the blues. So I'm going to grab this and bring up that blue level close to where the green level is. And then I'm going to click the red level and pull it back down. And already you'll see that the white walls and white door are much whiter, uh, but the, the brightness isn't quite there yet. So we're going to go back and globally click this, or actually click this to affect all, both the luminance and all the colors. And we're gonna drag these over. Oops, somehow I just lost my color balance there but we'll pick it up again. So I'm gonna bring these up and I'll quickly go back and I don't know why that, that snapped out of it, but it did. So I'm gonna bring this up to the green level and then we'll pull back the red level. 
a little bit to kind of match that and balance it. Okay, there, now it's balanced again. Okay, now let's get the luminance part and I'm just gonna leave it un, unchained there. Okay, so I have that. It looks like the colors, it looks like the blue can come down just, just a touch. So I'm gonna take this and drag the blue down ever so slightly to where it's not quite touching the line. That's a pretty well balanced interior shot. Uh, whites are white. Um, so if I go in and drag this back and forth, you can see that as I go from there, I'll step outside in the next shot and all of a sudden it's blue. So um, this was shot with interior white balance outside. So you'll see that everything is very, very blue. Again, kind of like that shot of that picnic. Um, and oh, I see we're already at noon, so I'll try to wrap this up as quick as I can. So again, applying the same techniques, um, we can see that this RGB parade is not in line. So what we're gonna do is we have these white walls here, and I could, I could cheat and I could use a white balance selector, which is, which is right down here and try to nail it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and, and do the same thing here with the, the curves. So let's go to the blue, and let's pull the blue down a little bit to where it's kind of in line with the green. And then we'll grab the red and push it up this way and bring it up, and you'll see they all kind of are nudging to a line, and there we go. Um, I'm in the shadow again, so my flesh tone is not going to be really saturated, but I can uh, bring up the saturation. There's a saturation control at the bottom here, so I can drag this up, and you can see it boosts the saturation. So maybe if I go to, oh, I don't know, maybe 75 or 80 percent, that might be good. And then... That's pretty well color balanced. It was late in the day, so there's a little bit of warmth. You can see the, the white wood here is still kind of white. There's some, some warmer tones, but still you can see that there are white parts to it. It's not possible to eliminate every part of color out of that. Uh, they're, they're, in sunlight, you're going to get different variations of color. But if there's something that should be white, there, then there's a white component. There should be a white component somewhere in the shot that matches. Okay, so let's go ahead and just raise the overall brightness up on this and bring it up. And you'll see that, and then our dark areas are pretty close. I'm gonna drag their blue down slightly. And that's looking pretty good. It's pretty, pretty even with the others. So again, in just a few minutes, we we're able to color balance both of these shots. So if I go back and I play them in the edit, um, that they, there's continuity there. And I go to walk out the door and we have pretty well color balanced shots between the two, okay? Tony, can you show them the thing where you click on the box to like show before and after? I, this sure. is always like, I love this part of color correcting because it's... Okay. Wow. So here's before and after with this shot. So that's how it started and that's how it ends up. Okay, let's go. We can go back to the other, the other one. Let me uh, go back here. Okay, not the most flattering angle for me, but you can see the difference. And how just by using those simple controls, um, you can make, you can do a lot of work just, just with a few uh, strokes of your mouse um, and bring everything into balance. There, there are white, there's a white balance selector that'll, that will get you pretty much in the ballpark, but I found that by using this RGB parade, it's a, it's a great, great tool to have in your arsenal and how quickly you can visually see what you're doing here on the scope, regardless of what your color monitor is or what your eyes see, uh, this won't lie. If, if these all match up, then your, color, your shot is color balanced. And then you can go ahead and apply if you want to do color grading, which is more advanced. 
you can apply a color grade over this and get the tone and the mood that you want for your shots. So um, it looks like we're just a few minutes over. Um, does anybody have any questions about, about this? And, and thank you for your patience too, for hanging in there. Um, I had a feeling it might be close and we ran a few minutes over already, but uh, I thank you for, for staying. Any questions anybody has? Is, did this help? I have a question. Sure. Um, I was just wondering, how do you download DaVinci Resolve onto a MacBook? Okay, great question. Um, I actually provided Seth with a link to go right to the DaVinci Resolve download page on the Blackmagic website. Is it and, in the chat? Um, I think he's going to, uh, Seth, are you going to post it in the, in the comments area or? Yeah, or I'm going to I'm... send it after i'm gonna send it so i'm gonna upload this video okay and then i'm going to um send it to everybody that was on the calendar invite so okay. they'll have a laundry list of links that they right. can click on that will be helpful to them okay and within those links uh there's there's a, a youtuber out there that does really great instructional videos on especially on davinci resolve but i think there's also some stuff on on um premiere his name name is jay lippman L-I-P-M-A-N-N. And he does a really good job and he's not your typical kind of obnoxious YouTuber. Um, he gets, when you go to his videos, he gets right to the point and he dives in and gives you very straightforward information. So a lot of the stuff that we covered in this presentation, um, he covers in some of his videos and there are other people out there too. YouTube is a great resource for this. You can find, uh, almost any question you have can be answered by somebody there. And even though um, DaVinci Resolve, people are just kind of, are just now really getting into it. Um, there's a lot of help out there for Final Cut and a lot of help out there for Premiere. And the DaVinci Resolve crowd is really gaining ground and really moving ahead. Um, the great thing about this with DaVinci Resolve and why I've moved to it over the past, uh, especially over the past year or so, um, the tool set is so complete, even with the free version. And this free version, it's not like it has a 30-day trial or things are watermarked when they go out. You have the full DaVinci Resolve just minus uh, a few niceties that the paid version has. Um, the differences are you, you don't have the direct GPU render support. So if you have a hot GPU card, uh, graphics card in your computer, it may not take advantage of that and just use the CPU for rendering. Um, and also you're missing some of the noise reduction tools and things like that. So if you do a, a really aggressive grade and you pick up a lot of noise, like if you have something that's underexposed and you have to bring the levels up and pick up a lot of a noise and grain, um, it has tools in there to remove that noise and grain and give you a nice clean image, even if you had to make some aggressive correction on it. So, it's not a 30 day limit. It doesn't run out. There's no watermark and you can learn all of these wonderful tools. There are, there are tools on here. I haven't even thought of what they do yet. And it, every time I use it, I'm amazed by discovering some new tool. And to think that the majority of the tools available in the free version, uh, you know, that you can just download and install on either a Mac or PC is really amazing. There's no monthly fee. You get free updates, even for the free version. And if you want the studio version, um, you can either buy a camera and they'll bundle it, the, the, the full seat license with the camera, or you can pay $300 like you would for Final Cut Pro and be able to have a package that will do not only what you can think of, but anything, <laughs> a lot of things you've never thought of that I've never thought of doing uh, can be done in here. It's, it's a, an amazing uh, package and well worth your time. And it doesn't cost anything uh, for the free version. And you can learn 95% of the full version and the free version to make use of it. So anyway, that's my plug. Um, I'm, I'm a little uh, biased because I, I'm, I'm using this now and have just fallen in love with it. So anyway, um, thank you again for coming. 